At the Sports History Network, we're proud to introduce you to a new sponsor for our podcasts. It's Home Field Apparel, your premium collegiate apparel brand right out of Indianapolis. They've got incredibly comfortable t-shirts, plus they're officially licensed with vintage college designs. They have over 150 plus colleges available now and always adding more. Homefield digs through the archives and history of your school to find unique logos, mascots, and moments to make thoughtful designs for your school. When you shop today, new customers can get a 15% discount off their first purchase using the promo code SPORTSHISTORY at checkout. You can learn more at homefieldapparel.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. The Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, is where some of the most famous names in baseball, heck, some of the most famous names in American culture, are honored. Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Ty Cobb, Ted Williams. More recently, guys like Tom Seaver, Hank Aaron, Ken Griffey Jr. But, you know, there are also names in the Hall of Fame whom many don't recall at all. Guys like Jake Beckley and Dan Brothers, Chick Haffey, Bid McPhee, Ross Youngs, several others. On this episode of Sports Forgotten Heroes, we're going to look back at the career of one of the most obscure inductees into the hall. A guy who played the game for 16 years, hit 279, and was on two teams that won the World Series. His magic with the glove, however, is what set him apart. He's a beauty of a story, Dave Bancroft. This is Sports Forgotten Heroes. A tribute to the stars who shape the games we love to watch and the games we love to play. Stars who provided us with many thrills, but when their time was up, they faded away. We'll take a look back at their spectacular careers, their moments of fame, even if it was just for one season or just one game. And now, here's your host, Warren Rogan. Hello and welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes, episode number 122, Dave Bancroft one of the most obscure members of the Baseball Hall of Fame. Bancroft started his career in 1915 with the Philadelphia Phillies and finished it with the New York Giants in 1930. In between, he also played for the Boston Braves and the Brooklyn Dodgers. Oh, while he ended his career with the Giants in 1930, his first stint with the team from 1920 through 1923 were some of the best seasons of his career, a span that included three trips to the Fall Classic and twice the Giants won it all. Joining me on today's podcast is author Tom Alicia, who recently released a book about Dave Bancroft called Beauty at Short. Now, If you're looking for a really easy read, and if you like baseball history, this certainly fits the bill. Tom delves into a lot, but his writing is smooth and it flows so well. Seriously, pick up a copy. You will enjoy it. Before we get into today's show, just a few reminders and notes. Follow Sports Forgotten Heroes on Twitter at SportsFHeroes. Look for our page on Facebook and don't forget to visit Sports Forgotten Heroes online at sportsfh.com. Also, Sports Forgotten Heroes is a proud member of the Sports History Network. Check out the site online, sportshistorynetwork.com. There are a lot of great shows about the history of the games we love. And if you're a fan, check out the shop. You can even get a pretty cool looking Sports Forgotten Heroes coffee mug. That's sportshistorynetwork.com. 
Okay, let's get into today's show about the great Dave Bancroft with my guest, Tom Alisi. Tom, welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes. Thrilled to have you aboard. Ah, it's nice to be here, Warren. Hey, um, when did you first learn of Dave Bancroft and what interested you so much that you decided to put pen to paper? There's uh, 10 years ago, uh, my wife and son and I were on vacation in northern Wisconsin. And northern Wisconsin, especially along the Lake Superior border, is a very isolated place. And the closest city uh, was Superior, Wisconsin. We went into there and we took a look at the internet and to see is what's what's in this town and uh, of note. And one line was uh, underneath most of the other things, and that was Baseball Hall of Famer Dave Bancroft is buried here. And all three of us are big baseball fans, and it was just that piqued my curiosity right away. And I said, "Can we let's let's go stop by there?" And we did. We couldn't find the grave site. Uh, we eventually did. Uh, it was an in-ground, very anonymous uh, stone and uh, right off a uh, gravel road. Uh, his wife was next to it. Um, no mention of baseball, just husband, date or, you know, birth, death, his name. That's it. Nothing. And uh, that, that began my curiosity 10 years ago. Uh, I'd always thought it'd be a, an article because of, uh, you know, microfilm is just so monotonous to get mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. details. Well, then suddenly I had a lot from microfilm. And then four years ago, I realized that if I combine three newspaper websites in terms of that cover about 85% of the papers in the country uh, and literally started from 1891, his date of birth, straight through to a couple of years after his death, which was in 1972. And I thought uh, there were so many nights that I would stay up late and the next morning I would tell my wife a new Bancroft story. And that's when I knew, I thought, I've got a book here. Huh. It's so funny that you say that Bancroft's tombstone or headstone was just so plain and not a lot to it. Because I don't think that you are that far off by saying that Dave Bancroft is one of baseball's, if not baseball's, least known Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at his stats on paper, they're not that impressive. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 279 career hitter with 32 home runs, 591 runs batted in. Not overly impressive. Yes. He played from 1915 to 1930. So what made him a Hall of Fame player. And of course, we're going to discuss so much about it, Dave, on the podcast. But in short, what made him a Hall of Fame player? You know, his uh, his glove. And uh, and there is to a degree without the flips, obviously, there is there is a legitimate comparison to Ozzie Smith. I was just going to go in there. I was just thinking to myself, if you're just talking about glove, you know, I don't know if Ozzy gets in on offense alone. He's definitely getting in on his glove. And that's, uh, that's very much Bancroft's story. In fact, one of the greatest things that's happened about this book, and so many wonderful things have happened since it came out five months ago. But uh, two days ago, I got a text uh, from a friend, and that person was in St. Louis and uh, passed along a copy of the book to Ozzy Smith. And I thought that is that's, that's cool. the greatest. <laughs> that's <laughs> it cool. Get much cool. Yeah, it doesn't get much cooler than that. Uh, I thought that that's really neat. Um, so yeah, he, there is that similarity is 
is really significant. And yeah, you know, those numbers, you read them off. And, uh, you know, when you said the home run totals, I had to take a look and I thought, was it really that low? And I thought, yeah, okay, he's right, 32, you know. Uh, but the uh, the 279, I mean, we do have to keep in mind that, that six of those seasons were during the dead ball era. Mm -hmm. to eliminate mm -hmm. those, suddenly that batting average jumps too. Yeah, he had years where he hit 318, 321, 304, 319, 311. So it's not like he was an awful ball player by yeah, heck he's a hall of famer, yeah. but he, it was a, 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 a two seventy nine career batting average. And you're right. He crossed the bridge from the dead ball era to the live ball era. Yeah. And the, uh, you got to look too, I think at, uh, some of the, uh, teams that, uh, he was on and the fact that he played in four world series as a rookie in 1915, he was a significant part, uh, played every game, I believe. If He might have missed one, uh, his rookie season with the Philadelphia Phillies, and helped them get to the World Series. Now, granted, okay, that team had Grover Cleveland Alexander as a pitcher and a workhorse, too. So uh, that helps. That helps. But, you know, uh, Grover's shortstop that whole season was a rookie named Dave Bancroft, who – spent six years, barely got into the major leagues. Uh, and that's part of the unlikely part is, is the story beforehand too. But keep in mind, you know, so two World Series that he was a significant part of, or four World Series that he played in, but two of them uh, that he won with the Giants and played extremely well, uh, beating the Yankees 1921 and 1922. So there were, there were always moments in there that uh, were significant. And I, I guess I'm kind of defensive sometimes. I, you know, en enough of this. Hey, I, I've done such a deep dive into his career and enjoyed it so much that uh, uh, it's, it saddens me that it is uh, his story was so forgotten. Uh, but it's one of the wonderful things now, too, that with the last five months since the book has come out, uh, he's had two hometowns. Uh, he grew up in Sioux City, Iowa. And uh, he lived most of his life as an adult in Superior, Wisconsin, a very isolated spot. Uh, hockey players, football players, uh, Olympic curlers. That's where, you know, it's a cold place, Superior, Wisconsin. Uh, and that's where he lived from, geez, age 20 until his death at age 82. So um, he was isolated. Uh, but, you know, there there is a, a, a sense that... Uh, those towns now, uh, thanks to the book, thanks to some of the people who live in those places, uh, we've got a plaque now at the minor league park in Sioux City, Iowa, dedicated to Dave Bancroft. And uh, it's wonderful that that's happening. And it's also stunning how few people in those cities, the cities that you would hope that really would know beforehand about him, uh, don't. Uh, or weren't aware or vaguely, vaguely aware that, oh, yeah, yeah, there was a Hall of Famer who was <laughs> born here, uh, but not not like you would so many others. And then right. uh, you see so many other uh, honors for how towns respond to players who, you know, either grew up in their city or lived in their city for a long time. Uh, quite a few are honored. There's there's nothing in Superior, Wisconsin. And mm -hmm. uh, we're working right now to change that. <laughs> in fact, yeah, that was, yeah, sure. Yeah, literally with the city of Superior. So, um, and it's looking very good. Good, Like something will, uh, will happen. That something will be named after him or a plaque will go up. Oh, that's cool. Well, let's go back. His road to the uh, major leagues was not easy. He made his debut at the age of 24. Um, but to get there, he certainly bounced around a lot. And yes. he nearly quit a few times, too. So tell us about his time in the minors and trying to break through. And by the way, he played in the PCL, the Pacific Coast League, as well. And yes. that was almost like a second major league back then. I mean, teams, they were not affiliated with major league baseball teams. So baseball was quite different 
back in the early 1900s. Talk about Dave's journey to Philadelphia and the minor leagues. And it was it was bumpy. Uh, before the PCL, uh, where he played with Portland, the Portland Beavers, uh, he was right out of, or before he even finished high school, uh, because there's no record of him even playing his senior year of high school at Sioux City High School. There is during his sophomore and junior year. Uh, we have pictures and names, but not during his senior year. That's because in all likelihood, he had already left to join, and I love this name more than anything, the Waterloo, Iowa Lulus. The Lulus. <laughs> uh, Low-level minor league team. Wanted him. He uh, started out fine there, uh, but the manager uh, was furious at one error that he had made, and then the, the next one, a ground ball deep, he wasn't sure whether to try to force the guy out at second, throw at the first, and he hung on to the ball. Manager was so upset. This is 19, keep in mind, 1909, 1908. <laughs> right. Uh, it was 1909. He was so furious that he cut Bancroft. Bancroft went up to north to Duluth, Minnesota. 500 miles north in 1909. He gets a tryout. And of course, in those days, tryouts were, hey, we'll put you in a game. Here's a uniform. You know, you're a member of the team. Uh, let's see what you can do. And he played a few series with them. And uh, he did fine. He had a, one particularly very good game. But they cut him. They had enough uh, players. They were set. Uh, they were an experienced team. And fortunately, the story doesn't end there because the manager of the superior minor league team happened to have seen a game. His team had started out 2-13. and 13. He saw a game, and in all likelihood, it probably was that game that Bancroft played really well. He took Bancroft right away. He needed players for his team, good players, especially a, a good fielder. And Bancroft always throughout his career, you always know that he's he's fielding well. He joined Superior. Uh, he's three years at the lowest level of minor league baseball uh, for three years, 1909, 1910, 1911. And when I say lowest level, that's a lot of stuff. And you're talking more than 300 teams Wow. In the minor leagues. Yeah. Wow. So, and, and not a lot of major league teams in the National League or American League. Three seasons there. And fortunately, he gets a shot in the PCL with the Portland Beavers after three seasons. He gets there. And what's the problem? His hitting, he's not hitting well to the point where he packed his bags and walked to the train station and he was happened to run into one of his teammates who said, well, what's, where are you going? He said, I'm going home. I can't hit. And it was one of the veteran players on the team. It was Bill raw meat Rogers. I just love that name. <laughs> and he turned him around and he said, don't come back. You know, uh, he recognized uh, certainly the fielding, but then at the same time, you also recognized that this was a young guy. Uh, right. This was the, and, this right, was the main going. this was the main situation with Dave. All glove, no hit, and Absolutely. and he was just so darn discouraged that 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 Rogers and I think a guy by the name of Art Kruger, yes. you know, took 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 Dave under their wing. And helped him become a better hitter. Because, again, that was the crux of the situation with Dave. He had a terrific glove, but he struggled at the plate. Yeah, and with them, they they made one key uh, suggestion among many suggestions. But, but the one that did change it was uh, they told him be a turnaround hitter. At that time, that's what a switch hitter was called. Let's try it. And he immersed himself in that and was a switch hitter then his entire career after that. Uh, he also, you know, they, they gave him suggestions of other things, which is, you know, everything from a lot of practice to, 
you know, lay off certain pitches, things like that. Uh, and uh, interestingly, one of the two then goes on to uh, uh, Kruger becomes a uh, minor league coach for a very long time after that. It's, it's interesting to see the backgrounds of these two guys. Uh, the ones who did then give him a little push. But, you know, here's what happens then in Portland. In Portland, he's in the PCL. He sticks around then for that whole season. And what happens the next season? Portland adds a second team, a minor league team, and called the Portland Colts. And they join the Northwestern League. And that's much lower than the PCL. And the second season in Portland, that's where they put Dave Bancroft. And he starts to hit better. His glove is always there yet again. And the next season, his sixth in the minor leagues, which was they're starting to get up there in numbers, you know, when you're in six years in the minor leagues at that time. And he had a very, very good season in, uh, in 1914 with the uh, Portland Beavers and the PCL. Uh, that alone should be get you in to the major leagues. But there were a lot of hesitant uh, teams, and the Phillies had sent somebody to go west and sign someone else to become their shortstop. And what happened was that player was starting to make overtures that he might go to the federal league the new league that was starting up. Sure. And that was enough to scare off the Phillies scout who was signing, wanted to make sure that someone was there. He signs Bancroft. Bancroft then shows up in spring training with the Phillies. Pat Moran, the manager, says he looks more like a jockey than he does a baseball player. (laughs) But after a few weeks. I mean, he wasn't wasn't exactly a big guy. I mean, he was 5'9 and weighed 160, sopping what? (laughs) <laughs> there's a but that's not an uncommon size actually for players at that time uh he certainly wasn't small i mean the, one of the remarkable things whenever you see a photo of uh especially the new york giants uh of that time uh often the infield lined up frankie fresh heine gro uh and uh high pockets kelly well high pockets kelly was six foot four and he just absolutely towers over all three of these guys and photos that you see so uh the size wasn't you know was was he that short uh you know yeah five foot nine one of the things with touring with the book is i made sure i thought what's the one thing that i could get that would get some attention and that was uh for exhibits and we've had two of them in uh, museums in his hometowns uh and that was a life-size cutouts of them and the life size cutouts are oh, six interesting. feet. Interesting. They're six feet. So we, I, you know, made him about three inches taller than he actually was. <laughs> His life size cutout is actually too big. So, uh, you know, he looks pretty good in the uh, life size cutout. But the real thing was now strike zone was a little smaller, I think. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, before we go on, um, it was in the minors where he earned his nickname beauty tell us about that you know there is there is uh quite a bit of debate as to whether it started there or not the first time it's ever mentioned and just like you brought up earlier how that uh pcl was really a considered like a second uh big leagues it really was on that west uh-huh. coast yeah and um there is so there are newspapers in portland uh, geez, Los Angeles Times. I mean, you know, the whole West Coast covered their teams extremely close. There's never a mention over three years of the nickname Beauty. Over five and a half seasons with the Philadelphia Phillies, there is never a mention of the nickname Beauty. The first time it pops up is when he joins the New York Giants. And the New York Papers pick up on the fact that he says the word beauty when there's a good play in the field or he's at bat and there's a pretty good pitch, uh, you know, that might just blow by him. And he says, beauty. He says that 
and they pick up on them and that's what it is. The, the odd thing is that the Hall of Fame biography of him does a big pull quote uh, on the page and it talks about that this started in Portland and I I can't find anything that he was doing that and uh, maybe he was saying that but he certainly wasn't nicknamed Beauty until the New York sports media and at that time just massive influence that they had <clears throat> excuse me and they uh, they started calling him Beauty in 1921 so it's really started a little later uh, and then it really picked up even after his career and I think even to contemporary times because it's such a fond nickname uh, that it stuck with him uh, throughout so so he go he bounces around the minors up and down and up and down and yep. finally signs on with the Philadelphia <laughs> Phillies in 1915 and he actually had a decent rookie season mm -hmm. 254 seven dingers and those seven home runs were the most he ever hit in one season had 30 ribbies 18 doubles two triples he had yeah. 15 steals. He led the majors being caught 27 times. But it was mainly his glove that kept him in the lineup. Tell us about his rookie season and how that set him up for such a successful 16-year career. Yeah, the, immediately, you know, when, when Pat Moran was the manager of the Phillies at that time, uh, when I say talks, to, you know, described him first, he looks like a jockey instead of a baseball player. Uh, you know, at the same time, he also recognized uh, Bancroft's, what Bancroft can do in the infield. Uh, and Bancroft called him later his first real manager, his first real coach, uh, somebody who worked with him uh, extremely closely and even more at a, at a higher level in terms of uh, – batting and fielding moving around he was one of the first shortstops to start to move around depending on who the batter was and then his rookie season what was so important uh is the the team won and i mean let's put this in perspective in terms of philadelphia by philadelphia standards the phillies ended up winning the nl pennant that season and that is a shock because there was a wonderful headline beforehand, and that is gloom awaits Quaker City in 1915 <laughs> season. And that was before the season started, okay? So that's preseason. They win the NL pennant. They go to the World Series. In the game that they win, Bancroft plays a, a key role. He hits 294 in the five games. They lose mm -hmm. four games to one to the Boston Red Sox and a, another – uh, World Series debut. Uh, it was Babe Ruth's World right. Series it was debut. His first too. World Series. Uh, one at bat. He was, of course, a pitcher for those first few years of his career, but uh, he didn't pitch in the, that World Series, but he did one at bat and uh, made a ground out. Uh, but Bancroft came through in the one win that there was. Now, what's significant about that? Well, let's talk about Philadelphia history. And that is that Philadelphia then does not win another World Series game. They didn't. They lost 4-0 in the 1950 World Series. They don't win another World Series game until 1980. Wow. And yeah, isn't that amazing how many years? And the irony, too, is that despite the fact that he, he did play a significant role on several very good Philadelphia teams, including one that went to the World Series, is he's in the Hall of Fame, but he's not on the Phillies Wall of Fame. So <laughs> you still have, you know, probably the only guy in Cooperstown who's not in a team that he played for for five and a half years uh, Wall of Fame. Uh, something we try to, once again, uh, influence or try to uh, hope that they will... Uh, pay attention to, hey, wave our flag for uh, Bancroft to be included. But uh, Philadelphia fans aren't as welcoming, I think. Uh, they probably don't even, even know. They probably don't even know the name. 
<laughs> they, they've started to, but they, um, you know, they, they're skewing now towards, you know, contemporary players and, uh, and definitely looking at that 1980 team that won the World Series. And you're seeing a lot of those players get in the Phillies Hall, Hall of Fame. You know, uh, so the Phillies lose that series, a 1915 series. Um, obviously, they had a great season. Mm -hmm. And in your book, Beauty at Short, you mention a couple of other unique things about that World Series. You know, uh, Bancroft hit 294, Babe Ruth, it was his first World Series. Woodrow Wilson was the president at that time, and he became the first president to throw out the first pitch. Yes. But what I find most interesting is the Phillies and the Red Sox both opted to play in stadiums that were not their home stadiums. Yes. Why? I mean, that's weird. I mean, the Phillies play all year at Shide Park, then they play the World Series at the Baker Bowl. The Red Sox play their year at Fenway at the World Series, they opt to play at Braves Field. The What's Phillies, going they, on here? Well, the first, uh, the, the Red Sox did change. The Phillies did play at Baker Bowl. The World Series was played at Baker Bowl, where oh, the I Phillies th I thought uh, they played were their shot. home game. Oh, they okay. didn't, they opted against it. And in the end, who knows oh, whether oh, it's, that's right. they, right. they, they wanted had the to opportunity. Or not. They had the uh, opportunity to play at Shot. And they chose but against they, it. Uh, yeah. Right. Okay. And of course, you know, I mean, at that time, and this was significant. I mean, can you imagine at that time, that bonus for winning a World Series probably was as much as your salary, you know, at that time for a player? So this is significant money. Can you imagine today if, you know, and then the loser's share was probably, oh, 60, 70% of what you were making during the year. So, and that share, of course, was determined by one thing, and that is how many fans came and how much money was gate receipts were totaled. And then that was portioned out and divvied up to the players, to the winning team, and then to the losing players. And Bancroft, uh, you know, that money was, that money was really important, uh, especially to a young player. Uh, that's why the Braves or the uh, Red Sox chose not to play in their home field. They went to the Braves field, which is just could fit more fans in it. Um, and obviously increase the, uh, the share for each player. So amazing at that time, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. And they chose the point is is why they chose not to play in Fenway Park. So that's crazy. You know? Yeah, that's just it's just crazy. <laughs> this brand new, this brand new, well, relatively you know, be three years old at that time, you know, the sparkling <laughs> Fenway yeah. Park. Yeah. So as we talk as 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 we've discussed, he had Dave Bancroft had a marvelous glove. Talk about the kind of impression that he made on everyone with his slick fielding. I mean, here he is. He's just like, you know, two years into his major league career, and he's being compared to some of the game's greats at that time. And he was doing things no one had ever seen. You know, one of the people he's most uh, mentioned with is uh, Hannes Wagner. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, uh, Hannes Wagner, we get that, you know, that the baseball card that's worth, you know, I think it was no. just sold again for like $12 million. I, yeah. I mean, you know, it's just astonishing, but, and, and, and the remarkable thing is, is, you know, I mean, obviously today, if you mention that name, Hannes Wagner, immediately you think of just the, the baseball card, but at that time, that was the player, you know, when you were starting to be compared with him, um, that's some, uh, good company, you know, you were definitely getting, uh, some respect that way. And, uh, Bancroft just continued that and his, his hitting started to improve. Not, you know, I mean, each of the years with the Phillies, 
Um, they lost as soon as they lost Grover Cleveland Alexander, and he was traded, you know, for the owner. The owner took him because he needed, you know, was more interested in cash than making sure that he had a good team on the the field. Uh, so Grover Cleveland Alexander left after the three seasons at Bancroft, first three seasons at Bancroft was there. And, uh, the, you know, the Phillies were fantastic. They were second place in the second and third years at Bancroft. Yeah, I mean, there. the Phillies were good. And, and a lot yeah. of that had to do with Dave and, and mm -hmm. his glove. But, for instance, like in 1916, they go 91 and 62 with a tie. Yeah. But he broke his ankle towards the end of the season. And with Dave in the lineup, or with Dave not in the lineup, they just were not as good. How devastating a blow was it to the Phillies that Bancroft couldn't play? And just how much of a difference was he, or how much better was he than his replacements? You know, and there are, his replacements come in, and, and, you know, he was such a staple at shortstop that, and you see this throughout his career, that when replacements come in, you know, odds are they hadn't had a lot of time at shortstop because he played a, a lot of innings. So even in that particular situation, yeah, then the Phillies start moving. Okay, we're going to take our third baseman. We'll be at shortstop right now. You know, I mean, there was not somebody who had very much time at shortstop. Uh, an injury to him may have cost them a chance at the pennant. Uh, in that year and in all likelihood did. Um, then you look through and it just really did continue while he was a Philly. Uh, you know, the, the, it, it becomes difficult. There, there's a season 1919 then when you talk about his time with the Phillies and, you know, obviously you, you can't escape uh, the cloud of World War I during that time. The, the season was shortened. Uh, you know, obviously priorities were 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 split you know there was talk of just stopping base should we continue baseball at all well there's a, a war going on um and a number of players you know continued and 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 some stepped forward uh to join the the war effort uh bancroft did not he was married uh and he uh chose not to uh join in uh in 1919 um, at the same time, Philadelphia, right at that time too, and towards the end of World War One, you see that Philadelphia is dealing with uh, not only the uh, after effects of the war, but uh, the Spanish flu overwhelms that city in the last year and a half that uh, Bancroft was playing for the Phillies. And when I see overwhelms, I'm saying that they were tens of thousands of people died in that city from a contagious Spanish flu. And the irony of it is, is that the city and the Phillies were very much supportive of it and participating, had a uh, parade that was trying to support the war effort but in a sense, it worked in horribly in reverse that it it, it spread a flu, just as wow. from, you know the COVID virus could spread. Right. Well, a flu, a deadly flu, continued to spread right there. Uh, so there is the end of his time in Philadelphia is not a good one, I, and he was ready to go, and I think they were ready to deal him. Yeah, yeah. And so so it's let's a talk. Wonderful though. Yeah, what uh, happens is great. So they, 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 they go to the series in 15, his rookie year. They're really good in 16. They finish in second. Mm -hmm. They're competitive in 17. But 1918, 1919, and 1920, they're, they're pretty much a, a bad team. The owner of the team, you referred to it before, William Baker, yep. always seemed to be in some sort <laughs> of financial distress. Yes. And, and he and Dave just didn't get along. So the Phillies shipped Bancroft north to the New York Giants for cash. Can A you lot. tell us any more about that? Was there any other underlying reason why the Phils would get rid of Bancroft? 
Oh, no. And in fact, uh, Baker got on a train because he could not believe the amount that the New York Giants were willing to give them. Now, there were a number of other teams, Cincinnati Reds, Pittsburgh, uh, that were interested in Bancroft. Bancroft was hitting well at that time. His batting average is now way up there. You add that glove once again. Uh, you have a, still a young man, you know. Uh, he definitely yeah, has a lot of years. 1929, he's yeah. only 29 years old. Yeah. And for that season, oh, my he had 299. And, uh, but the one man who wanted him the most and stepped forward and paid $100,000 uh, was John McGraw. And it was a wonderful pairing because those two, as, as gruff as McGraw was, uh, Bancroft was his kind of player. Scrappy, uh, let's just move up one base, you know, uh, relentless, uh, somebody who's going to be in there day in and day out. Uh, not going to be a problem for you off the field. Uh, they got along superbly. Um, and that uh, really helped, I, obviously, both of their careers. I think one of the things that's forgotten is McGraw didn't win a World Series for a number of years before Bancroft showed up there. And obviously, he was not a one-person team on the New York Giants. That team was was loaded with with great players. But, you know, he was part of that cog. The, he was the captain of the team. He was the leadoff hitter. And and they start to win. They start to win a lot. Uh, and they go to three straight World Series. Yeah, you know, around this same time, well, off the field, he's living a pretty good life. He's happily married. And, and, and you refer to this. Uh, in your book, he's happily married. He and his wife, Edna, wanted a family, but it didn't happen. Tell us about how unfortunate they were, and did it have an effect on Dave? You know, that is, uh, um, that's probably the saddest part of this whole story. And, uh, you know, when you're doing research on a player like this, you're you're doing it on your free time and you're doing it for me. It was very late at night, very late at night. And uh, throughout everything that I had read about Dave and his wife, Edna Bancroft were that they had been married 60 plus years. It was a very, very close relationship. They got married when she was 18 and he was 19. That's the major reason why he stayed in Superior, Wisconsin his whole life, because that's where her family was at. She was extremely supportive, a great, a great supportive baseball wife for him. Knowledgeable about the game too, went to the game, supported him. They are described as childless in every single mention of, of her, of uh, him, of his family. Uh, and that's not true. In, in that 1920, uh, Edna gave birth to a, a girl, Mary Jane, and she lived only 16 days. Um, during that 16 days, you can see that Several newspapers quoted Dave as being just ecstatically happy about having a, a daughter, uh, having a child. And uh, then you hear nothing after that. And uh, he was even, for the first time in his career, uh, was not at uh, spring training when it started that season and comes back and it just sort of says it's his private reasons or personal business or something to that effect. Uh, but certainly uh, the fact that this couple uh, didn't have a child is certainly one of the saddest things to uncover. And then to see what had happened uh, and the fact that there is there, it was never discussed. Uh, there is no uh, article. And then the sad part too is that you see through his career then later how much he was uh, loved by, or just loved children. Uh, yeah. And Edna yeah, was too. Yeah. There's absolutely fantastic stories of them 
babysitting, uh, kids of other players, kids of uh, uh, sports writers, it includes, uh, their own nieces and nephews. Uh, they were, and uh, one of my favorite pictures, and, and so many photos from, say, pre-1930 of baseball players are that, you know, that, that stone-faced look. You know, it's it's the same photo. I see it over and over and over, and it doesn't matter who the player is. And for Bancroft, there's just a fantastic one where uh, when he's later with the Boston Braves and he's holding up a, a child who's at the game. It was a boys club event. And uh, he holds up the boy and his face is just, he's just looking up in such admiration at the at the little boy that he's hoisting up. And that's, that's just fantastic. It's just, you know, and it, it happened mm -hmm. clearly throughout his life. And one of the wonderful things about the publication of the book too, is that I've heard from people uh, who remember him in the late 1960s and early 1970, 1970, 1971. And they said that they remember walking to school and seeing Dave and Enda give them a wave as they they would sit on their porch and they would see them as they're going to school and they mm. would just wave at some of the kids. So I think it's definitely, you know, something that is, uh, clearly this was a couple that would have made uh, magnificent parents. Uh, and unfortunately we're not able to be it. Tom, one of the things I always say to my guests who have written books, of course, is we can't cover everything because if we did, There'd be no reason we'd be here a while, but there'd be no reason to buy the book. So we do jump around a little. So let's get back to the diamond. Tell us a little bit about Dave's relationship with John McGraw. Oh, uh, wonderful. And uh, one of the books that uh, gives the best indication of someone who was able to view it on a personal level, and that is uh, Mrs. McGraw. Mrs. McGraw wrote a book, and uh, John McGraw's wife in 1952, she wrote a book about John, and she talks about that. Uh, her husband laughed more with Dave Bancroft than with it, just about anyone. Uh, and that just shows the personal aspect. She also admired uh, Edna Dave's wife. Uh, Bancroft then is really influenced too by McGraw's style. Yeah, Dave and McGraw's wants to become style a manager. Is, yeah. McGraw's style is, you know, is uh, is rough. You know, I mean, is old school at the time when old school didn't exist. Uh, it was you know, my way or goodbye. Right. And uh, he carried that over then into when he became a uh, player manager with the Boston Braves um, shortly after uh, several years with the New York Giants. The Giants had one heck of a team when when Dave got there. They were really good. They, they twice they went they, twice they won the series, as you said earlier. 21 and 22. How important was Dave to their success? And that had to also be a part of the million dollar infield. Yes. Oh, Who I consisted of the million dollar infield and why were they known as the million dollar infield? And then you got to go back and tell me again how important Dave was to their success. He was, uh, he was huge, you know, at shortstop. Uh, he was also the team captain, too. So there was uh, uh, a sense of, you know, that uh, he was McGraw's voice on the field, too. Uh, he followed that. Uh, he settled in really well. I mean, and, and it, it helps, too, to have Frankie Fresh right around you, too, on that infield. And, uh, you know, I mean, George High Pocket Skelly, the first baseman, you know, became a Hall of Famer, Heine Grow. Uh, they were dubbed the million dollar infield. And, and of course, now you, you look back and well, you, you assume that it's literally, but no, there, of course, their salaries weren't anywhere near, you know, I mean, they right. would have been the, 
the uh, $50,000 infield. They're barely the $50,000 infield <laughs> if you took their salaries at that time. Uh, well, some guys but, make that and want it back today. <laughs> then they, you know, so there's, it's great that, uh, that, that description of, of those guys is the million dollar infield being, uh, how good they are. Um, and, and, and a way to describe them. What's, what's the best way you can describe them? And they come up with, you know, that this is the million dollar infield, uh, something out of, you know, out of reach. So it was magnificent. And, you know, he had a lot of wonderful games with the, with the giants. And in fact, one of the games with the, um, whether it was motivated by the fact that he was, I mean, he certainly wasn't upset that he was traded by the Phillies, but it is ironic that, you know, Bancroft as a giant plays the Phillies and he goes six for six. He gets six singles in a game in not in a nine inning game. And at that, of course, a number of people have done that, but uh, in nine innings, you know, all singles mm. uh, are him. It's, it's vintage Bancroft in terms of his batting and he's not going to get you uh any long ball, but uh, he's going to peck away and, and get on base and make things happen. Uh, there were other guys on the team, and this was with Philadelphia too, that could drive him in. So there were, uh, you know, those were those were wonderful years for them. And unfortunately, then the the twenty three World Series it became, you know, Ruth just took over, uh, and the Yankees, Yankees as a whole, right. Uh, right. really did. Well, uh, well, well. Let, let let's talk about this for a second. So, overall, the last year of his career, nineteen thirty, he 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 played a couple games with the Giants. Mm -hmm. But really, when you look at his career with the Giants, it was a it, it was parts of five seasons. We'll call it. He yeah. he hit three ten, stole forty eight bases, won two World Series, both against the Yankees before losing in the 1923 World Series to the Yankees. And then he was shipped to, the, to Boston, to the Braves. Why? There were, uh, it's, a, it's multiple reasons. Number one, uh, in the 1923 uh, uh, season, uh, part of the season, uh, he's injured. He's replaced by a young shortstop named Travis Jackson who became a Hall of Famer himself. Uh, McGraw had a backup shortstop. He knew that, and he wanted Travis Jackson to play. At the same time, he was never going to sell Dave Bancroft short. They were too close. And at the same time, he knew that Dave was ready to manage. And Dave really wanted to. And he traded him then to the Boston Braves. And at that time, when you look at all the articles, everybody feels like the Braves got the great part of the deal. And in the end, for the most part, they did. Uh, that it was McGraw doing a favor as much for Dave Bancroft. Being a player manager at that time meant a significant pay increase. Uh, and also it was an, an idea or prestige came along with that too. Your star players, you know, Rogers Hornsby and a number of other players uh, were player managers. And uh, unfortunately for Dave, he's, his one, the, the Boston Braves weren't a great team and his playing was sensational, but to manage and to play was extremely difficult. When you look at it, few people lasted more than a year or two doing it. He did it for uh, four seasons with an extremely struggling team. So when you look at why would uh, John McGraw give up, you know, a guy he likes and a guy who was playing very well and help bring him to a World Series? Well, two reasons. I think one was that he knew that Dave wanted a chance at manager and McGraw was able to make that happen. Uh, they remained extremely close. And of course he comes back in 1930. Um, the other reason being that, you know, there was uh, in the back of McGraw's mind was that he wanted this Travis Jackson to, to get a chance. And uh, 
you know, <laughs> Travis Jackson delivered for sure when uh, after Bancroft left. So it, it worked out for both of them. Um, he, he managing though was, you know, it's one of the, the things that he, when he looked back uh, decades later, uh, wasn't a whole lot of success. Regret, yeah. Know. There wasn't a whole lot of, not a whole lot of success there. Um, and it's weird because here he's the player manager, but after the 1927 season he gets shipped to Brooklyn. So here he's a player manager and now he's no longer the player manager. He finishes his career in Brooklyn, uh, two seasons. Mm -hmm. Um, well, not really finishes his career there because 1930 plays 10 more games for the giants. When did the thought of the hall of fame enter his mind? Did it, did you know, it not... enter the mind of anybody else who thought he was worthy of induction at what point? Well, you got to then uh, keep in mind that the, the, the first group went in about 1936 or so. I mean, uh, you know, right, so it exactly. didn't exist. So, uh, exactly. when it, he was on the ballot a number of times from 1938 to 1962. The, now this is the the writer's ballot, and we all know that anyone who gets in that way, it's a pretty obvious choice. Uh, there aren't a lot of questions uh, about players who get in that way as to whether they deserve it. In fact, it's it's uh, they're almost too difficult to get in, uh, or you know sometimes that they'll make players wait a couple extra years when really they're their choices that are pretty obvious throughout that uh time that he was on the the writer's ballot of course there was never a chance he's going to get 75 percent of the vote none <laughs> uh he wasn't getting in the highest he got was uh 16 and a half percent uh during that time yet when throughout the 40s 50s and 1960s, when people would put together their all uh, players who played at the polo grounds team, uh, favorite shortstops, uh, you know, all time switch hitters, uh, best fielders came up a lot too with him. Uh, when Connie Mack looked back on 50 years of Philadelphia baseball, he, you know, Dave Bancroft is named right on with them, you know, uh, and picked. So his name is always right there in a Hall of Fame discussion, definitely not at the writer's level. And then fortunately, they add the Veterans Committee then in 1960s. And that is where uh, uh, many, many players of a real high caliber get into Cooperstown. And that's what the job of that group was to find those players that the writers maybe, well, yeah, missed or uh, were maybe set their standards way too high, but yet still were deserving players. You do see him mentioned, uh, Pie Trainer in 1964 says, you know, Bancroft should be in the Hall of Fame. So there were hints of it. Uh, Dave Bancroft did go to the Hall of Fame in 1965, uh, but he paid his way in. <laughs> he just went to the <laughs> he went to the Hall of Fame to as a uh, like you and me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just, you know, you pay your admission, you walk around. No, he didn't make a big fuss of it at all. Uh, but that's true. He was uh, 75 years old. Uh, he knew that there was a veterans committee, he knew there was a chance. And uh, certainly when Frankie Frisch joined, uh, he knew that uh, maybe he'd be part of discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the years rolled on, and that includes with Frankie Frisch there, 69, 70. Um, 1968, I believe Frankie first started on that committee, nothing, you know, he wasn't getting in and he's 80 years old. He's not in great health 
and uh, actually very poor health. Uh, he didn't think it was going to happen. He thought his time had, uh, that his chances had come and gone in those last years. And boy, he was wrong. <laughs> yeah, how surprising was it in 1971 when the Veterans Committee voted him in and gave him a phone call saying, hey, guess what, Dave? You're a Hall of Famer. He was stunned. He was stunned. And what, what happens is, and it's one of the biggest myths that I hope the book dispels, he is lumped with the Frisch's pals you know, the teammates of Frankie Fresh, most of them St. Louis Cardinals as opposed to New York Giants, who Fresh got in through the, the Veterans Committee. But if you really look at it closely, 1971 was the perfect storm of 12 people who met in New York on January 31st, 1971. And two people were added or new to the committee, replacing two other people. And the two people who were added were Wade Hoyt, who pitched against Bancroft in all of those World Series as a New York Yankee, and uh, Bill Terry, who was uh, a star on the team well, uh, when Bancroft was uh, an assistant coach with the New York Giants. Uh, that helped already in that then were three other players who played with him at that time, four sports writers, two of whom were very close friends to Bancroft from way back until even the time that he was an elderly man. Uh, they maintained friendships. Uh, you had then some executives, and then you have Frankie Frisch. Did Frankie Frisch go in there and stomp his fist and say, Dave Bancroft is in? Uh, definitely not. If he would have, Dave Bancroft would have gotten in the Hall of Fame one, two, three years sooner than he did in 1971. No, in fact, that's the, the myth really is, is, is that Fresh engineered this. When you look at the number or the people who were in there, who were talking, sitting around a table, discussing who gets in, who doesn't, uh, you separate Dave Bancroft from the group of the Frisch people because there were too many other people who are on the record as being such huge fans of Dave Bancroft that were on that committee and afterwards spoke very highly of him too. So you know that they were yes votes uh, right from the beginning of the conversation. Now, the fact that seven people got in that year uh, it makes a lot of people roll their eyes. Did he get in because he didn't deserve it, you know, or, oh no, it's just so he's lumped in with the fresh group. But when you look at those people that uh, everybody rolls their eyes at and you take a really close look at uh, everything in their careers, Bancroft deserves to be there. There's mm -hmm. no doubt. Mm -hmm. All right, a couple last things before we wrap up today's episode. You said that when he looks back at his career, he sort of regrets managing Boston, but he did want to be a manager. And after his career ended, he bounced around a little, managing Minneapolis, Sioux City, St. Cloud. But he also managed in yeah. the All-America Girls Professional Baseball League, and he managed for four seasons. Yeah. So, what is he? What 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 did you find out about that? How did he enjoy that experience? Uh, he loved it. He really did. Uh, not the last season because it was he was eventually with a team, the Battle Creek Bells, and and there was a lot of financial trouble and they were losing. Uh, I, that was a difficult season. But just eliminate your from your mind the Tom Hanks character in a league of their own. This was, <laughs> Dave Bancroft was not a boozy, uh, you know, someone who kind of half looked at the players and, you know, didn't care about the games. He took it real seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, and he also is part of uh, one of the things in women's baseball history that isn't mentioned is he was the manager of a team that, of women's all-stars from that league 
in winter January to March of 1949 that toured and played in 50-plus games in Central and South America. Wow. I mean, that is remarkable at that wow. time that yeah. they were playing then Cuban women and or they would play, they would take the t- American teams and split them into to two teams and and play an exhibition there and in in all sorts of countries uh dave bancroft manager played in in more than 20 countries which is just astounding at that time to think of it uh he was loved in south bend where he was a coach for two years in the women's league uh there's a wonderful picture of Dave Bancroft night at the South Bend Blue Sox game. And uh, there's four of the players, you know, each puckering up to a man they called Pops uh, and Mm -hmm. respected. And uh, also realized, oh, you know, he was a really good player. No, he took it very, very seriously. You know, uh, I always, I say that he's not, you know, uh, I'm sure he didn't mind if there was crying in the, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, in the, uh, in baseball. Cause he probably did it himself in some of the seasons, I think, cause he took it, he took it very seriously. He also, there's a lot of quotes, uh, where he defends the game, uh, and also, uh, highlights, uh, some of the women who are still now in either just have I've passed or are very old right now. Uh, A lot of those players at that time, he was willing to speak out for how good they really are. Yeah, I mean, he's wonderful to see that there's a series now, you know, on Amazon. Yeah. uh, Plus or streaming uh, from it. And the the movie, of course, you know, gave it all the attention that it deserves. But he said that it, it, it was not a novelty that the women really knew how to play they they amazed him so that's one of the, that's pretty cool one of the great things about his youth and one of the great things that i stumbled on is uh he played uh as a teenager on a team called uh the black knights uh they were called that because they were owned by uh they were a semi-pro team uh owned by a man named bobby black and they would play you know, they wouldn't barnstorm, but they would play exhibition games against minor league teams. They were all adults, but the only teenager, the only 16-year-old was Dave Bancroft. Well, one of the teams that they played that was touring uh, were the Boston Bloomers. The Boston Bloomers are a forgotten, perfect for this show. Boston Bloomers in 1908 were a traveling, nearly all women's team. And they played them. He played that team in 1908 as a 16- and 17-year-old. He was in games against that team four or five times. Uh, So women's baseball. Now, the Boston Bloomers would come into town. And and if you see team photos of them, I'd say six, seven of the players were women. And a couple others were men uh, who came in. But they were very much billed as a female team mm-hmm. and the, the, the crowds loved them. The crowds loved the Boston bloomers. They went into his hometown and were cheering on that. And it's one of the things I love. And I, and I, I, I tend to think there's, there's no, nobody ever asked him to tie, you know, you played against this uh, a team years ago of all women. And now you're coaching them, you know, does that, did that influence you? But I have to have a, a gut feeling that, uh, he certainly knew that there was talent, even as a teenager. I mean, he saw it in too many games. There were extremely close, good competitive games against a very good semi-pro team he was in against women. And then uh, later, he's in his 60s, early 60s, and he's managing the uh, in the women's professional league. So he had respect for that from the, mm-hmm. from the beginning. Very cool. All right, let's wrap it up with this. Like we said at the beginning of today's episode, and as the title of your book suggests, Beauty at Short, Dave Bancroft, the most unlikely Hall of Famer, and his wild times in baseball's first century, he's not a typical Hall of Famer and might be 
the most obscure, arguably the most obscure and unknown of all inductees. Why? What makes him so obscure and unknown? That's a fantastic question. And uh, I don't know if I can answer that or I'm afraid that I could answer that if for another hour. <laughs> How's that? Uh, you know, uh, I was really surprised at how his hometowns, and again, where he grew up in Sioux City, Iowa, and uh, Superior, Wisconsin, then where he lived for 60 plus years, uh, had forgotten him. Uh, there were people that do remember that, you know, that tried to keep the name alive, but, uh, it didn't work for whatever reason. Um, uh, I went back to his house and now what's significant about that house in Superior, Wisconsin, where he lived for 60 years, not a very big house, a very modest house on a pretty busy street in Superior, uh, that was the house that the phone rang on January 31st, 1971. And he's in the middle of Sunday dinner with his wife eating chicken. He answers the phone and it's a Milwaukee reporter saying you're in the baseball hall of fame. And he staggers and said, that's the nicest thing I've ever heard. And uh, he wasn't able to go to the induction. His health prevented that. He died one year later of heart failure. Uh, there are not many autographs of him with the plaque, the postcard plaque that you see a lot of the Hall of Famers that have on there. Uh, he did fade from view. He also was not somebody who trumpeted himself. Uh, there was an event for him after he was in the Hall of Fame uh, that included a lot of people from Minneapolis uh, and then in the Minnesota Duluth uh, and Superior areas. And he asked not to speak although he did say a few words at the end uh, of the event. So he was not somebody to trumpet himself at all. Uh, but at the same time, it was just magnificent. And uh, I uh, went to the person who, this is how obscure it was. He lived in, that, in a house in Superior, Wisconsin for 60 plus years. Uh, I was there a month or two ago and a man next door was there and i said do you know who lived here decades ago are you aware and he said he had lived next door for about 10 years and he said you know he gave a name of some woman and i said no no i'm talking about way way back he said no i have no idea and uh I said it was a baseball hall of famer. And he said, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> he just couldn't believe it. You know, he just did not believe it. And I told him the story, gave him a copy of the book. He said, Oh, great. I'm a baseball fan. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then he told me the story of the house in, in recent years. And he said, you know, uh, the house became then, Obviously, a, no one was associating the family. They hadn't lived there. The Bancrofts had not lived there. Uh, Edna died in 1984. Uh, so no one with the family was associated with the house. But over the years and in the last 10 years, it had become, as he described it, a drug house. Uh -huh. And at that time, uh, when I was there, standing there, I could see the graffiti was unbelievable everywhere. Inside, mm. inside the house, which mm. is a little unusual. Uh, fortunately, it was bought by somebody who had no idea that a baseball Hall of Famer took a phone call in that kitchen and learned, uh, yeah, I'm in the baseball, I'm off the Cooperstown. <laughs> uh, and it was, it's being remodeled now. Uh, but I mean, it had to be the interior was stripped to nothing. The point of that story is, is that really, you know, yeah, had he been forgotten? Absolutely. He had been forgotten by way too many people uh, in places that he had been. And, and it's wonderful now to see that wrong be corrected. And it's, it's so wonderful to hear from people uh, as a result of the book. But it's also wonderful that the book, just like Dave Bancroft, we were, this is a tiny publisher. We were told 
by some pretty good players in the book business, brace yourself because books about obscure old time baseball players, even Hall of Famers are a hard sell. You're going to have trouble. And just like Dave Bancroft, uh, the book has been a shocking success. Yeah, you got a lot of great reviews on Amazon, a lot of five-star reviews. And I encourage everybody to go out and get a copy of it. It really is a fun read. You you tell some great stories in there. Um, You really uncover the story of a terrific baseball player, a guy who was Ozzie Smith before Ozzie Smith. (laughs) And um, I'm so glad that you connected with me and that we're getting this on Sports Forgotten Heroes. This is what this podcast is all about. And Tom, I'd like to thank you so much for spending an evening with us to tell us about Dave Bancroft. Warren, I really enjoyed this conversation. This was a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. You know, I recently visited Citizens Bank Park where the Philadelphia Phillies play. They have a Wall of Fame there. And there are 69 members of the Wall of Fame, including players, managers, executives, and owners. Amazingly, Bancroft is not one of them. He's a Hall of Famer. He was a key cog in the Phillies team that went to the World Series in 1915. That was the last World Series team the Phillies had prior to to 1980. This is a gross oversight, and I hope that Tom's book and research on Bancroft help bring to light the amazing career that he had, and it sheds light into how important a member of the team Bancroft was, and that this Hall of Famer ultimately gets his plaque on that wall. He is definitely deserving of it. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Sports Forgotten Heroes. And thanks to my guest, Tom Alicia, for spending so much time with us. Pick up a copy of his book, Beauty It Short, wherever you get yours. Again, thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes. just another ordinary day in the offices of the Pittsburgh Guardian newspaper circa 1924. But for Marla Delft, assistant editor, everything was about to change. For she was about to discover the awesome attractiveness of Row 1 brand retro sports paraphernalia items thanks to Orville Mulligan, sports writer. And there it is. Wow, Orville, that's really the bee's knees. Isn't it just? A poster-sized replica of the actual 1909 World Series program cover. I can see that. But where did you get it? And where'd you get it framed? I ordered it from the Row 1 website, where over 6,000 items of sports memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1990s are available for reproduction, in multiple sizes and in several different materials, with over a dozen styles of frame to choose from for prints like this. Well, I'm sure Mr. Delft would love to put up more of these in the office. But I'm equally as sure they're beyond this newspaper's budget. <laughs> Not at all, my dear Marla. See for yourself. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Oh my, these are good prices. Oh, and look at this stuff. Oklahoma, Nebraska football. College basketball art. Michael Jordan items. And so it was that Marla Delft discovered the spondiferous magic of Row 1 Sports Memorabilia Arts and Prints. You can, too, by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full Row 1 catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act today for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan, sports writer, coming soon. Oh,